face to face, hand to hand, film to film. Welcome to another episode of Film to Film. My name is Iñaki Clinier. I'm here with uh, my good old friend James Shergan. Uh, today we watched. Uh, today's the very last day of the of the year. I know once once you're uh, listening to this recording, uh, you'll know that uh, it's 2022. But uh, since, you know, we're still within the holidays, we decided to uh, end the year with a very bright, very uh, happy uh, film, you know, dealing with, uh, with uh, the uh, warmness of, the, uh, of the, the holidays. That's right. We're going to the club. We're going to the club, indeed. <laughs> Except not, maybe not the kind of club you want to get invited to. I don't know. <laughs> they do some dog racing. That's true. <laughs> this is true. All right. Uh, well, uh, well, before you start, uh, you know, uh, have you watched anything lately? Uh, me? Uh, I just watched um, The Power of the Dog on Netflix, oh. which was pretty good. Um, definitely a pretty interesting drama that shouldn't be spoiled, but... Uh, pretty good um i liked it it reminded me a lot of paul thomas anderson um well done drama yeah um and uh the club those are probably two most recent recent watches Mm -hmm. yeah i guess my two most recent watches are uh, i watched last season of uh, money heist and uh the uh on jennifer's body oh nice i saw jennifer's body in 2021 for the first time too uh pretty good actually i i liked it it's yeah an interesting film yeah i would say uh, uh 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 definitely extremely underrated when it came out for uh, sure it it sounds like it's uh it's starting to build a cult following maybe we'll talk about that movie uh next year maybe not uh yeah yeah that that would be an interesting movie to sort of uh discuss and dissect um definitely i don't know i mean uh yeah, uh, one that I think, as you said, has been sort of reevaluated. I think for the better. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, it, it it has a good writer, uh, same writer for Juno. Uh, so I forgot her name now. I think Diablo is her last name or something crazy like that. Yeah, no, I know who you're talking about. Um, I didn't expect to talk about Jennifer's body, so I am ill prepared for this conversation. Oh no, we're both out. Yeah, we we yeah. both are. Uh, I'm getting off topic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, let's uh, jump into the film. Um, so uh, we watched the club. Uh, this there are many movies, m- many films uh, called the club. So we watched the film called uh, the club from 2015. Yep. Uh, directed by uh, Pablo Larraín. Uh, it was also uh, written by Larraín along with uh, Guillermo Calderón and Daniel Villalobos. Uh, cinematography was by Sir, uh, Sergio Armstrong. Mm. Um, so before going to the movie, I, I'll, I'll just uh, maybe 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 folks have heard of Pablo Larraín. Uh, maybe pronounced Lorraine instead of Larraín because in English, uh, you know, that's how it's mispronounced. Hard R's. Yep. Uh, and in fact, uh, he has a Hollywood movie. He. he he, he now directs Hollywood films. Uh, his latest one being uh, Spencer, the one about uh, Lady D. Right. And and he also did Jackie, um, which uh, is probably the only Hollywood film I've seen from him because I haven't seen Spencer yet. Uh, so interesting. Uh, yeah. And Jackie was a film that I thought was uh, pretty well made, but didn't do all that much for me. So when you picked this film, I was like, oh, OK, it'll be kind of interesting to go back and look at what... Uh, uh, Pablo uh, Lorraine uh, did in his earlier Chilean works because um, I know he kind of has a pretty strong presence there. He's probably one of the more um, well-known Chilean, Chilean um, producers and directors um, uh, currently working. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's him and his brother, uh, they're probably the biggest uh, producers uh, of films. So they have a production company called Fa- uh, Fabula, mm. uh, Fabula. And I mean, it's almost a monopoly at this point, like literally, because uh, uh, Faula basically has um, 
uh, I, whether it's production or distribution, they kind of have connections all over the United, St- like all over the world, especially with the United States, Amazon, Netflix, etc. Mm. So like, mostly in films that do make it here, uh, not just films, films, TV shows, etc. They were probably produced by uh, the Larraín brothers. Right, uh, and one example like, would oh. probably be would probably be a Fantastic Woman, which was done by produced by them but not directed right that was by um the other guy we did sebastian uh lelio uh, yeah lelio or something yeah i can't pronounce his last name (laughs) but that guy yeah yeah exactly so i mean that's that's a very big big example Mm -hmm. um uh but yeah Pablo larraín himself he uh has directed many movies i've actually have not seen that that many even though he's so he's he's quite big uh like i've I've seen uh tony uh, tony manero which i think was Mm. his first like big ish movie uh i watched neruda and uh the club and i watched part of jackie and i thought it was boring okay Uh, well yeah i i would agree with your assessment of jackie sadly (laughs) and by the way i i would say neruda is also boring and tony manero i also consider it a little bit boring so why did I pick a movie by this director? Because I had also watched The Club, and I think that this is my favorite film out of the ones I've seen. I have not seen No, which is, uh, I would say, his most famous film, a Spanish, Spanish language film in the U.S. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, it was nominated for an Oscar. And, uh, uh, and you know, I, it, it's on my list, but uh, I have not seen it. And um, I have not seen Spencer or Emma either so i mean i I haven't seen many of his films either so okay i mean it looks like he's really been quite prolific in the last um seven or eight years in particular starting off with maybe this film so um yeah i was a little bit reticent when you did this film just because i i found jackie to be really uh lacking in energy especially it just didn't do much for me um so uh i was uh yeah so anyways i'm sure so 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 with that knowledge uh-huh. What do you think of the film? Uh, I thought it was really good, actually. Um, I thought it was very impressively made. Um, uh, I, it definitely exceeded my expectations. Um, I was reading some of the reviews, and it came out the same year as Spotlight, uh, which won the Oscar for Best Picture, which really makes it kind of an interesting companion piece with it in in mm-hmm. pretty obvious uh, surface-level ways. Um but I thought it was a really well-made film, and I thought uh, just strong character work, strong production quality all around. Really a, a film without too many weaknesses that I can think of. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think, uh, I mean, yeah, this is basically the reason why I picked this film. I think it's, uh, uh, I mean, visually it's beautiful. Uh, I, I think the, the, the actors in this film are probably at their, at their top like level. Uh, in quality so i mean that that's where you get to see both the quality of, of the actors that, that he picks but also his directing it comes through and then um and then for the subject matter this movie is quite funny uh i don't know if the subtitles it gets through the uh, its humor but uh at least in the in its original language it's it's quite funny Interesting. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I would describe it, describe it as quite funny for the English language audience, but it's not that dour in tone uh, if you just consider the subject matter and what actually happens plot wise in the film. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, and it's it's interesting to compare. Uh, I, I guess maybe yeah, maybe it's not as dark. I, I guess what 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 I mean by quite funny is that uh, it. It, it has a dark humor in it, like a, a, a gentle or soft dark humor, especially in the dialogue between the priests. Um, uh, perhaps because of how disconnected they are with the reality mm-hmm. uh, and the reality of their deeds. Uh, it, it also has some, a, a sort of a dark humor in... I don't know. Uh, and again, this is the part where I was not paying much attention to the subtitles. So, you know, some some stuff could get lost in trans- translation. Right. But, right. Uh, but you know, the survivor, Sando Khan, 
mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it's really sad when you think about it, but his dialogue was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I could get that. Um, I, I guess it's just a little challenging um, as an English audience uh, being less familiar with sort of the tones that they're taking to know exactly what to feel at a certain point, especially because I'm not as familiar with, um, I don't know, the creators of this. Uh, but yeah, it 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 does have... I don't know. Yeah, it does have an interesting tone. We, we can certainly dive more into it as we get into uh, the film. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and it def- definitely feels like a lighter movie if you compare it with uh, Spotlight, which was the movie that came out that same year. Uh, Spot- Spotlight is a very dark movie uh, all through. I think there's no moment of levity. And, and this film, I mean, very different plots, but this film... Perhaps because of the plot, perhaps because, you know, the perspective is literally put within the members of the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a lesser... Right. I mean, in in, so, in many ways, Spotlight is a simpler film, um, at least for me to understand. It's like, you don't ever, you're not really asked to sympathize with uh, any of, like, the the um, the offenders, the, the, the um, Catholic priests in that case. Um, and this film is interesting because, it, I mean, they almost are interesting companions, but they just take 100, like 180 degree different angles on the material. Um, and so this one, like, makes you spend all this time with these people. So you really get to know them. You see the rationalizations. In many ways, it's a lot more complex characterizations of these people, um, of, of the priests. Um, so, yeah, it, I don't know. If, uh, I mean, I'm I'm a fan of Spotlight. I like that film too. I think this film is probably um, about the same quality, in my view, at least. Um, so they're oh. both quite good films in my in my uh, evaluation, at least. Oh wow, yeah, that's that's pretty high then. Because yeah, I'm I'm also a huge fan of Spotlight. It, it's funny because yeah, I would say Spotlight is definitely a bigger film when it when we're talking about uh, uh, events and you know what's happening a lot of things happen in spotlight and this one not much happens but it's much more complex in the actual uh details agreed agreed um yeah i mean spotlight it's it's a lot more of an investigative journalist film um and you're seeing it through that uh lens where you're trying to uncover um Mm -hmm. and this one it, it asks you some difficult questions in terms of just like uh, you know, you you get to see it, everything through the other character's lens, and you, the uh, person that is investigating or learning more about them is kind of the uh, difficult to understand, unscrup like uh, investigator priest. Who I guess in most films that person would probably be the person that you're seeing the lens through. It's like okay, I'm here to do this job and this thing. But this time you don't. He he presents a very hard exterior, so you actually probably see the least into what he's actually thinking uh, in comparison with the um, uh, the four priests and the uh, 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 the uh, uh, madre uh, that's there, <laughs> struggling to find the correct word for her. Mad, yeah, I think uh, she goes by Madre Monica. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um. So, uh, by the way, I did very little planning before the filming this uh before recording this so this is, will be probably one of the more uh, messy episodes here um so where do we want to start do we want to talk about like scenes do we want to talk about characters well or do we want to talk about themes where do you want to start uh i don't care i mean i guess i could just talk about a little bit about what's interesting about the film to me um okay. i thought uh i mean uh, well, I'm sure we'll get into the cinematography. We, we, I think we like to talk about technical aspects, or at least I know I do more than probably other film podcasts. Uh, but I thought one of the more interesting things in terms of characters is how you almost get d- uh, introduced to them in this almost documentary style where they're getting interviewed by, um, what's the uh, one uh, Padre's name? Is it Padre Garcia, the one interviewing yeah. him? Um, yeah, and so Padre he- Garcia. Right. And so you get to see all of the rationalizations and stuff like that. And you slowly get revealed um, what they were actually accused of and what they likely did. Um, and so it's it's just an interesting way that information is unraveled in front of you. And um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's just a very 
I don't know. It's just very different from other films. And uh, I don't think this film would be nearly as good without um, some of the very, very strong performances. I think just about all the performers um, do a really, really good job, in particular all of the uh, fathers and uh, the mother in this case. I, I think mm-hmm. they're all pretty incredible. They all have interesting and good chemistry off of each other. Um, and they have, uh, yeah, so it's like, I, I, I like the way information is revealed and the performances really help to make that stuff pay off. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I like how, um, so when, when I watched this film for the first time, I actually did not read anything about it. I was like, oh, this is the only film available on Amazon. This was like years ago. So I yeah. clicked and watched it. And, um, and, um, because of that, I didn't even know it was about, you know, priests, let alone priests that, uh, you know, molested children or, di- or committed other crimes. Oh, shit. Actually, before I go in that, into that, I will do the quick summary. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> uh, Last yeah, time so I quick- realized I didn't even uh, introduce our names. So the people that listen to our quacking New York Ripper podcast don't even know who we are. <laughs> oh, uh, go ahead. that's true. That's true. All right. So. So quick summary for for the folks who have not yet watched it uh, and somehow like to listen to movies be- without watching it. Uh, so summary, a crisis counselor is sent by the ca- Catholic Church to a small Chilean beach town where a disgraced, disgraced priest, a nun, uh, suspected of a crime ranging from child abuse to baby snatching from unwed mothers, lives secluded after an incident occurs. So that's that was a mouthful, and I think not very well redacted. Uh, that came from IMDb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you could make it a lot shorter, um, but I mean, I guess it's fine. Uh, <laughs> you yeah. definitely don't need to know the individual crimes uh, they're accused for. Um, but I am curious for you. Um, so this is your sec- ti- second time viewing it. Uh, when did you see it the first time, and how did you decide on this one? Is it just because it was like a Chilean film that you thought um, uh, uh, was like amongst your favorites that Lorraine has done? Uh, so the first time I, I, I was trying, I think I was on an airport. <laughs> like literally, I was like on a on a very long layover, and um, I wanted to watch. Yeah, I think I wanted to watch a Italian film. And I was like, oh, I want to watch the movie. I want to watch now. So I looked up, looked up uh, uh, Lorraine and I was like, oh, man, that's not available. But there's other movie available. All right, I guess I'll watch this. Uh, and, and that's kind of how it went. And, uh, and because of that, uh, I did not even know that it was about, you know, priest, mol- mm-hmm. the molestation or any of that. So... Going back to the filming style and the the, the, the structure, it was uh, everything to me was a surprise. Surprise, like um, you know, because it, it begins with beautiful shots of sort of introdu- introducing each character, but by their actions, not what they're doing, right? Not by w- what they say or who what they've done. So, you know, you get uh, uh, Padre Vidal uh, portrayed by Alfredo Castro, who, you know, is training his dog. You get the nun cleaning uh, and the nun uh, portrayed by Antonia Sechers. I'm naming the names because these are really good actors, all of them. They all did a really yeah. good job. Um, uh, I think, you know, the other person is doing some... Uh, the, 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 like former military chaplain uh, Padre Silva who was portrayed portrayed by uh, Jaime Vadel he uh, you know he's being harsh with something I mean you get you know you get a glimpse of doing each character doing little things and then all of that to get ready for the dog race mm-hmm. so, uh, and you figure out that there are really, there are like priests because they call themselves you know father mother all that stuff but throughout that entire process you don't get you don't under, you don't know like you don't know why they they are far away from the race and only the only uh you know the mother monica was uh, at the at the race location you don't know that you just uh you, you uh, and it's kind of neat and then all of a sudden you're like oh oh okay and i just love that that building on and, and it's just not obvious or anything it's just sort of like happens 
and, and yeah, uh, very naturalistic. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's almost like you you sort of just uh, joined in right before shit happens at uh, the slice of life of yeah. these characters. Yeah, and it's interesting. I was thinking about that uh, when I was first watching the film because, like, I feel like a lot of films would maybe open with, like, some sort of intro with, like, text or something like that, and then maybe they'd just, like, have the scene with, um, uh, who is it that, uh, Father Ramirez, uh, who, uh, is definitely sort of the triggering event for what d triggers most of the film, um, it, they, they could easily open with that scene or something like that with uh, Sandokan coming by and sort of acting as the chaos agent. But instead, they open with the dog scene. And I really like that decision because it just does kind of show you the glimpse of what the life is like um, before that happens. And you're still, um, you know, you're lo you learn a bit about all the characters and information is just very naturally revealed rather than like giving you some big exposition or a big text plot. I think I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I like it. I, I don't think... Uh, I think it's good character development t told in an interesting way. Yeah, for sure. Uh, especially, uh, I think one of the more power, like the moments where you start figuring out like, oh, how fucked everything is, is literally when, uh, you know, uh, the mother, uh, the, the nun is giving the rules of the house to Father Ramirez and then yeah. like, highly strict. And then you're realizing, oh, okay, no, this is, this is bad. And then she's like, oh, you're not allowed to get close to any children. And you're like, oh, this is really bad. <laughs> Whatever Father yeah, yeah. Ramirez did is really fucked, you know? Right, right. And you also sort of like, uh, I mean, obviously the other four uh, fathers uh, have gotten to know each other and stuff like that over the years. But you can see that they all sort of like put distance um, and they might judge the other fathers more harshly than themselves you really get to see like that internal rationalization and how um they see themselves uh fitting in uh usually in a more favorable light than maybe uh, us in the general society might see them oh yeah for sure i mean even ramirez even ramirez ramirez is like oh no i didn't do anything i'm not like the other priest and, and he's the one who at the end uh is the first one to, the one who commit suicide which is uh interesting because in a way it, it's almost like a front uh you could you you could say that like in in most of the moments when the the priests are talking about their their different crimes and all that uh they they show themselves as like you know we we uh we're innocent we didn't do anything bad mm -hmm. but you can tell that they're guilty inside and Ramirez is the best example because he's the one who's like, oh, I'm not like them. I shouldn't be following these rules. But then yet he's the first one committing suicide when he, uh, confronted with his crime. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I mean, as a result, I think we as an audience probably view him the least sympathetically. Um, we, Yeah. Um, I also don't know how they could possibly twist that uh, to, to make him be like remotely as likable as any of the other priests. Not that they're super likable or anything. But they are more fully realized characters. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting thing. Uh, in, in this film, in my opinion, I, I don't think any character is likable. Like, true, is, true. Likable is, I don't know. I mean, it it it, it presents complexity uh, in there. I wouldn't say they're dislikable completely either. I don't know. Maybe right. I'm a, too much of a softy uh, in that sense, and maybe they should all be like heinous beings. But that's not how they're presented. They're not presented as like very one-dimensional, cackling evil people. No, they're they're very human. Uh, I mean, you got, you know, you got uh, the Father Vidal, uh, the, the dog one. I call mm -hmm. him the dog priest. Like he. <laughs> You know, he 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 obviously loves animal. He is very weird. He's probably closeted gay. I think uh, he kind of. I mean, I I think he admits that too. I mean, he uh, he he sort of admits that, but he also probably did fucked up shit with children. That yeah, that's the part where it's very, that's the part he does not admit to, and that has been accused. And uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> and it's interesting his conversation with. Um, Padre Garcia too I mean just cause like he presents 
the the uh, director lets him present his case first, and then Padre Garcia, who you can sort of tell is disgusted with this guy, uh, says, uh, you, "You get a feel for more of the accusations against him," and you're like, "Ooh, ooh, okay, that's yeah. that's pretty rough." Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, and I think that's one uh, thematically speaking, uh, that's one of them. I think one of the more fascinating things about this film, right? It's Father Gar- Garcia represents the new church, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and portrayed by Marcelo Alonso, and the entire rest of the house represents the old church, mm-hmm. and uh, Madre Monica, who is not actually even a fucking nun, is probably the most powerful character in the entire film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I mean, her char- her story is also sort of slowly realized too that she doesn't necessarily have like a super clean past uh, herself either. Uh. Right. I mean, especially considering that each story that you hear uh, and her st- her story specifically is the only story where you actually do not even uh, you do not even hear the counter uh-huh. because uh, you know Gar- uh, Garcia is not looking for is not looking did not look up her background right so when when she tells you her story and you know that every person has told a story in the light most positive or the last mo- in the light most in favor of their case her story was pretty fucked she went oh, to yeah. africa came back with a with a black child uh, as she describes it and then the child was taken away from her because people accused her of beating the child when but she says that she didn't Yep, well, yep. that's the most favorable light. I'm pretty sure she did beat the child and probably abused the child in way uh, way worse w- manners. Right, right. And, you know, her role is probably the most confusing because, like, she initially presents as if she's, like, the caretaker and in charge. And, I mean, I suppose in a way she is. Uh, but, like, is she there as the caretaker or is she there as part of, like, one of the club, uh, so to speak? And uh, it's left a bit ambiguous, Um in in some ways, right? I mean, I mean, she cla- she she claims that she was hired as a, as basically as a warden, right? Right. And uh, and and it's interesting because this is the part where like going back to the new church and old church concept, right? Father Garcia is like, you're just a maid. He kind of tries to that downplay her position. Mm-hmm. While she's like, sure, yeah, I'm just a maid. I can still fuck you over. Um, I, I don't know. I love her character. I mean, there's this one character I was just like, damn. She, she's her. really good. Yeah, and there's a, I don't, you probably haven't seen this yet, but there's a, a TV show I really like this year called Midnight Mass, and they had a, a woman religious figure in there that I thought uh, reminded me a lot of her, too. Um, but speaking of the old church and new church too, I wonder if a bit of this film was um, inspired by um, uh, Pope Francis, uh, who uh, became the Pope in 2013 as sort of like the new church uh, Jesuit figure, um, sort of coming as a reform type. And uh, obviously, uh, Padre Garcia isn't exactly the Pope, and he presents a pretty um, uh, sour face uh, to everyone, but you could be seen in... Uh, I don't know, a similar face of like a new reformer um, that uh, doesn't necessarily look super sympathetically upon the uh, old guard. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, um, so I think it's explained that Father Garcia, he's not a prisoner, right? So he's, uh, he, he's more of a bureaucrat within the Vatican, like a, a, Ch- a Chilean bureaucrat, but that it's, wor- it's working directly under the Vatican. So mm. it is definitely uh, uh, plausible that it, it, it might be talking about uh, or alluding to Pope Francis's uh, uh, position as a Jesuit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, because, yeah, the, the, the head priest of that town is, who is not in that house, uh, Padre Alfonso, who shows up like a couple times. He's kind of like, it's. Imp- I think someone even says it that if, uh, Padre Alfonso is sort of uh, was trying to keep the church away from that house. 
was so trying I mean, to keep oh i see uh-huh. keep, keep, yeah keep the vatican away from that house like everything had already been resolved like years ago according to them and then you know this new investigation was kind of a pain in the ass mm-hmm. yeah um so kind I, of uh the greater church's role as far as like covering up um Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think th- that's a part where like the new church was already happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, you you may attribute that to Pope Francis, or you could just say, you know, that uh, the church church decided to stop covering shit up. Uh, it could be one or the yeah, other. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, fair, fair enough. I mean, I was just drawing more of like a larger symbolic point i don't know plot wise if they tie into each other although i suppose you could try to draw that link but it's probably getting a little bit over the uh, scope of the film anyways right uh but but nonetheless it is it is an interesting discussion right like um how so i mean so for chile uh the this whole i mean well it's probably same with boston when it when it happened right uh uh this whole debacle completely shifted uh, the view of the church mm-hmm. for everyone, right? And in the case of Chile, it's 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 rather interesting because uh, Chile probably was like it, like in the nineties, probably like eighty five percent or ninety percent of Chileans consider themselves Catholics, mm-hmm. and today I think the number is down to like sixty. Okay, uh, and, and or, a lot of that is tied, I'm guessing, to the sort of scandals that have happened. Exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, one of the uh, most popular priests uh, that was a parishioner uh, was discovered, like, not discovered, but people started, like, you know, uh, uh, accusing him of rape. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, no, he did rape. And he had, like... And it was awful. And I mean, there's a whole movie made about him just out of this priest because apparently, like, he had a lot of access to children. Let's put it that uh-huh. way. Yeah. So, so should he went Mark from... Ruffalo have come in and investigated the Chilean church too? <laughs> should have. He should have. <laughs> they knew. Uh... <laughs> they knew. <laughs> but yeah, uh, what's crazy is that uh, the uh, the the hiding of all, all the crimes went all, almost all the way up to the Cardinal. Uh, so, I mean, we're talking about like just a huge level of corruption. And of course, by the time you find out, it's past the statute of limitations. So it's like you cannot really prosecute it, the crimes. Uh, or at least in, in the Chilean law, you, you, they couldn't prosecute the crimes. Mm. So... Uh, uh, so I mean, all of that basically left a very bitter taste, and uh, and the church has worked really hard, and not in, I'm assuming, and, and this is worldwide, right? Not in Ch- not just in Chile, but in Boston, everywhere to sort of clean up their right, right, their act, right. Um, and, and I mean, and and like it's probably not totally a coincidence that this and Spotlight are coming out at the same time. I mean, they're both kind of a response to what has just been going on in the Catholic church. They're just uh, actualized in very different ways. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I mean, who knows? Maybe the, I, I mean, in the United States, we're still finding out new and new cases like every year, every other year. I think, mm-hmm. I think it was like 2019 or, tw- or 2020 when like there was this uh, like giant list that came out from Philadelphia. It was just like, uh, uh, you know, cases that the church had had kept hidden mm-hmm. uh so it, it it's it's an interesting concept and I, I i like the the battle between the old church and the new church because the old church almost uh I, 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 and this is a battle that you see a lot in many in many areas it's very political in a way which is one side that believes that by hiding the bad uh you keep uh, you keep a good image, mm-hmm. while the other side is compl- views it more as no, we gotta clean shit up. Mm-hmm. Like we we right. just really we really need to get rid of all the bad actors, and we gotta right, uh, right. And and in spotlight, you really see that in a bad way. Uh, just because like 
instead of uh, while they cover it up, they also put the priests in situations where it can happen again. Um, right. And so that was like a particularly damning fact uh, with the spotlight case. But this one, they cover it up and it's never exposed to the public, but it's kind of hushed up and they are put um, aside uh, in a spot where they can, in theory, uh, not offend again. Um, so they're basically put, uh, they're basically sidelined, I guess. Right. Uh, there's always the question of like, how long did it take? Did it t take the church, the local church, to to do that? Yeah. I mean, in the case of uh, Padre Ramirez too. I mean, like Sandokan is now a grown adult, and Padre Ramirez is a very old priest, and so yeah. presumably uh, Sandokan. Uh, it'd be shocking if Sandokan was the only uh, victim from uh, Padre Ramirez. Oh yeah, I mean Sandokan literally tells everyone. I mean, when when he when he's first yelling, he's talking about all the altar boys. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it tells you something. Um, the the I guess the other thing that's sort of interesting is how like, you could say in in the concept of sin, mm -hmm. is how you know gambling is a sin, at least under the Catholic Church. And how these priests just the same way it's the same way as they explain their crimes, they're explaining their gambling with the uh, race dogs, right? And one even like pointing out how the uh, greyhounds like the only dog mentioned in the Bible, which I don't know if it's true, but uh... <laughs> yeah, nor do I. Uh, but he has a biblical uh, reason for it, which is you know I mean a good example of how a lot of people will uh, take certain parts of, from. Uh, Bible and like twist it to mean exactly what they want it to mean. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and and in fact, there is the the, the that other powerful scene where uh, 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 Padre, uh, Father Garcia is like, "No, there's not going to be any more alcohol, uh, less meat, more vegetable." Like you know, he wants to like lay down the law. Mm -hmm. And then you got uh, you, you got someone complaining, and he's just like, "Look, you're living here for free, uh, thanks to the church. Uh, as of right now, I am the church." And then one another of the priests like gets up and it's like, "No, I am the church." And then when you realize, like, yeah, like this is a really complicated thing, right? Mm -hmm. You have you have this guy, young guy. I mean, in, relatively to the other priest who is trying to lay down the law. Right. Uh, yeah. And and all based on interpretation uh, and uh, interpretation of the uh, of the Bible, all based on the interpretation, not just the Bible, right? But it's a Catholic Church, so it's interpretation of Catholic rules and all that crap too. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um. So uh, besides that, um. The, uh, there's another this is the one part where I feel like Chilean movies uh, sort of uh, do not uh, ne necessarily connect with the rest of the uh, the public maybe maybe with Latin America but I don't know if with the US there was this the whole side plot with the uh, surfers what do you think of that? Um, I actually kind of liked it uh, the movie was short as is so I don't think it needed to trim that if this film was two and a half hours or something I might have been like yeah cut cut the stuff with the surfers um but i thought it was interesting development and i also think uh alfredo castro uh who played uh padre vidal is such a strong actor um and just you know it's sort of like the dog scene at the beginning is it necessary for the plot to show that you could probably do it more uh, economically or efficiently without it but it's a way to establish character and show and also just get a glimpse of how these uh these characters do interact with the outside world too. I mean, obviously he's also uh, trying to accomplish something um, by uh, having them attack Sandokan too. But I, I, I think it's strong enough and interesting enough that I, I liked it. I, I thought it was uh, good enough. And uh, Alfredo Castro, as I said, good actor. And he sort of kept me glued and interested in all of the scenes going on. So um, I'm, I'm actually pro server. Oh, that's good. Yeah. No, I, I liked it too. Uh, and I mean, definitely, it's definitely good for uh, uh, like us development for you know uh, Castro's character. Um, what's 
what I thought may or may not have gotten lost in 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 translation is the um, how the, the the surfer bros were also like extremely classist. I don't know if that um, got lost in translation. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, they were saying that uh, uh, Los Boca, the city they were in, was a shithole, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, uh, that that was one, I guess, hint at the classism. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I'm not sure if I I remember I can recall anything else. Um, but yeah, yeah. That- yeah, that's an interesting thing, and and, and I, I that's the part where I'm I'm always uh, I I should have probably paid more attention to the subtitles to see mm. how things play through, but but also again this is kind of a movie, this these are moments where mo- like, this is definitely a movie made for Chileans, and uh, so they indicate where they're from, so the neighborhood Santiago. where they're from, right? So right, but yes, Santiago, and then like one of them very, was very clear to say Las Condes. Which is a neighborhood in Santiago that is uh, rather wealthy. Okay. Then they're talking about when they're talking about Las Bocas, they're talking about like oh, they, uh, like uh, some one one person wanted to touch her hair because I had never seen a redhead, and uh, you know I was going to charge him for that, and then blah blah blah, and you know there was like that entire like conversation about like asking people like very low amount to have sex with a friend. But mm-hmm. like, the low amount for them, but a very high amount for the folks who they were okay. talking to. I mean, that was lost in translation on me for sure because I also don't even know the exchange rate. So I'm like, I don't know if this is a lot of money. I don't know if this is a hundred dollars. I don't know if this is like ten thousand um, dollars. So uh, I, I mean, I, I think the equivalent was like sixty bucks, which would okay. be a very which would be a very low amount. Right. Uh, right. So yeah, that that would be a lost in translation, and then. The, uh, so there's a neighborhood, there's that, and then, um, so yeah, th- those those little things that made uh, those characters really unlikable, and you're like, why is Castro f- hanging out with them? And mm-hmm. then you figure it out, oh, it's one, probably because he wants to have a human connection. It almost feels like uh, Castro was like trying to have human connection with other people. And two, as you mentioned, wanted to get uh, so- friends to beat up uh, on Sandokan. Right, right. He had an ulterior motive. And I think those scenes are also are good. They just, I don't know, they show him acting really awkward with the outside world, too. It's like he almost doesn't know what to do. It's like almost like he hasn't seen anyone for like three weeks and then he's trying to interact with strangers. And he just presents that really, really uh, well. Um, so, yeah. You also get the feeling, too, that Vidal, um, played by Castro, uh, might be the most outsider of the of the five of them too he's definitely like more of an insider than like ramirez or something like that but he's often shown uh a lot more on its own and i feel like he stands out uh, a little more i mean he's given more like screen time and side plots and stuff like that so you mm-hmm. also get the feeling that maybe he is like the loneliest of them too like he really really likes his dog and stuff like that so um i don't know y- you get hints that maybe he is uh sort of like the outcast when it's just like five of them uh there yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and I mean, that, that goes back to what you mentioned earlier, which was uh, how each priest uh, kept sort of an arm, arm length distance between each other uh, mm-hmm. because they all thought that each thought that they were do- they were better mm-hmm. one way or another, that their crime was lesser. And I mean, uh, uh, Father Vidal was the, uh, I think, the only other priest in the group that uh, it was presumed that he had committed, you know, um, some child molestation or whatnot. Right, right. Which, I mean, everyone would agree is fucked. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, not that, I mean, one of the other ones was like baby snatching, which <laughs> is pretty yep. pretty awful too. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, yeah. And I'm sure Father Vidal would uh, judge that one more harsh than his own. Um, which, I mean, he... Ve- vehemently denies that he's a pedophile um but uh you know it, it's like <laughs> i would tend to believe the authorities in this case exactly yeah no for sure i, I and i think um but that's the thing it, uh, uh father vidal he it, it seems like he is aware of his sin 
I don't know mm-hmm. if he's crime. While uh, Father Ortega is not aware of his sin. He's aware of his crime, but he doesn't think it's a sin. Ortega is the child snatching one. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, a lot less time is spent on him uh, than uh, than the others. Uh, well, especially compared to Vidal. But yeah, he is very, I mean, argumentative and basically that conversation uh, goes nowhere. I mean, you see his rationalization, which, you know, they all have rationalizations and the rationalizations all make some degree of sense. But it's like, <laughs> it's like there's a big difference between what he says and like, snatching kids in in that way and mm-hmm. i don't know it's just like ooh, that's what you're accused of that's pretty bad man <laughs> that's pretty yeah. fucking bad i mean probably the the the, the least bad and it's still very bad is father silva the whistleblower actually the non-whistleblower if you think about it i mean that that's the whole point <laughs> uh-huh. is that he yeah. was a chaplain for the military during the dictatorship right and he burned all his notes uh huh <laughs> to to make sure that yeah. no one was prosecuted yeah so yeah okay yeah the non whistleblower which again that that's more of a a very uh um that perhaps is the other one that is a very chilean concept right 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 and you almost need to know the chilean history a bit uh which thankfully i do know uh, enough of probably thanks to you right. uh that that i was like okay i can pick up on that context pretty immediately right yeah because that, that was one thing i was wondering it's like why 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 didn't this movie make it be like why wasn't this movie nearly as big as i don't know neruda the other the other chilean film by uh, La, lorraine that again it's not one of his top chilean mm-hmm. films but it's like way better known and I, I was curious like why this one and uh like what why was neruda like kind of more famous than not this one and i guess it's the international shit like neruda is about a world-known poet mm-hmm. and the rest the movie tells you about there's very little for you to to guess mm-hmm. by the way in my opinion that movie is boring as fuck but um see i'm not a huge fan of this director per se i think right that, right right in this movie, I think he did a great job. No, I think he did too uh, on this film too. I mean, it makes me curious to see uh, some of his other films that are not Neruda, <laughs> because I mean, usually you and I see you know fairly eye to eye on stuff, and we both agreed on Jackie independently, um, and that makes me a little hesitant on Spencer. But uh, you know, I I definitely watched something else, especially after this film. Um, I thought this film um, was you know really. Uh, there's just not a lot of flaws that you can really pick up on uh, that that I would say, oh, you should have done this and that differently. No, not at all. Um, now, let's, I was thinking, like, let's, yeah, let's talk about characters. So, I mean, we're talking about the uh, Castro's character, uh, uh-huh. Pad, uh, Father Vidal. Uh-huh. So, he's probably the, the most, the, the priest that we know the most. Mm-hmm. But also, the, in my opinion, one of the hardest to read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, I mean, he almost talks a lot also about uh, restraint and stuff like that on his, like, uh, rationalization there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that might be the best performance of all of them. Uh, it's definitely, mm-hmm. or, well, they're also good. Uh, Mon- Monica is also really good. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, just really solid all around, I thought. Very complex, too. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and then, I mean, Part of it, and I don't know if this is implied or, or or if I read it into it, but is it implied that he's having a relationship with his dog? <laughs> uh, I didn't see it that way. Um, okay. I was trying to see if it was possible that he was having a relationship with one of the other priests, but, uh, you know, as I said, it seemed like he was the most distant from them. Um, yeah. And, yeah, so uh, I, I didn't see it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... It's just because, like, the only time where you see him, like, really, really, really sad. I mean, he gets up, be- he gets beat beat up by, like, the, the bros, the surfer bros. Uh-huh. And he's still, like, fine. He, like, kept on getting up while getting punched. But then once he gets home, like, that's the only time where you see him completely destroyed is finding, finding his, uh, his greyhound dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, but, uh, yeah, I mean, people... 
I, I think people that have pets could probably relate to that. I mean, I don't think it's that unusual, at least, to be that attached. It's clear he has a hard time uh, forming relationships with humans, though. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, all right, so let's go on to uh, Mother Monica, who is technically yeah. not a mother because she's not a nun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she's great. I thought she was probably um, maybe the other performance I'd really highlight. I thought just really fantastic all around. Uh, mm -hmm. She just communicates with her pay face really well. And she, at times she just se puts off and she seems really kind. You know, like, oh, this person seems like a pretty good person. But I don't know. There's almost like something like just sinister and something a little bit off with her. And mm -hmm. then, I mean, at the end, we get to see her uh, fucking uh, 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 <laughs> basically kill a dog. And it's like, yeah, there's something way off with her. Um, and she's almost like the most terrifying sociopathic of all of the characters in a way. I agree. I agree. Uh, yeah, I definitely think uh, this is probably my favorite uh, performance by this uh, actor. Uh, she's mm -hmm. really good in other movies, too. Like every movie mm -hmm. you'll see, like she tends to be a highlight. But in this one, especially uh, she. Um, her character is supposed to be this nice, friendly person. But through her face, she communicates how sinister she can be. Mm -hmm. uh, even at the moment where she's blackmailing uh, Father Garcia. Right, right. Where she's like, okay, you're going to take down this house. You're going to take all of us down then. And you're going to take yourself down too because I'll make sure to to lie at being so good at mm -hmm. this. Yeah, and you believe her 100%. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, you know, very good. Now, uh, all right. So, Father Garcia. Um, he. I mean, I think his role is probably one of the more straightforward ones. Uh, he doesn't need to communicate a huge range of stuff, but he's good. Uh, he sort of has like stern, inscrutable. You do know what he's thinking most of the time. Uh, he's not a character that has stuff to hide like the others. Um, so he's probably one of the least interesting characters and least interesting performances. But uh, it does everything that uh, the director, Lorraine, asked him to do. So, I mean, with the actor, I don't know much about the actor. Um, mm -hmm. As a character itself, I actually think this one is the only character with an arc. All the other, hmm. none of the other characters change. So, so in, my, in my opinion, uh, even though he might be the simplest character, he's uh, and the one probably with one of the few, like very few lines, because he's just asking questions. He's the only character that actually changes, right? Uh, he begins with, you know, uh, uh, as introduced, it's like, this man will shut down the house. That's his entire goal. He, he, he's gonna get in there, get information, and wants to shut down the house, and even perhaps get the priest in prison if he can. All right, that's his wishes. Mm -hmm. And throughout the entire process... He basically realizes that he's fucked, especially with uh, 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 after talking Mother to Mother Monica. No, it's not Mother Monica. It's uh, Sandokan, the survivor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like after talking to Sandokan and noticing how Sandokan is literally treating him just like the other, all the other priests, mm -hmm. right? Sandokan is like, and I mean, that's one of probably dialogue wise, that's one of the more like. Uh, telling scenes where Sando Khan is literally like they're talking about uh, the you know what happened to him talking about the father committed suicide uh, Sando Khan kind of says that and he's the next character we'll talk about uh, but, but I mean Sando Khan at some moment goes like hey you know uh, yeah I know all of you guys are good mo uh, good man uh, by the way uh, you know do you want me to bring children to you I know some kids. They're a little bit younger. They're younger than me, and that's how you guys like him, and like shit like that. And you know, he's telling this to uh, Father Garcia, who's literally the only person who would not be within that area. But I feel like that's the moment where Garcia realizes uh, we need to do something about this. Right, right, yeah. And he realizes, like, <laughs> his only ally uh, sees him in basically the same light as the other uh, priests. Then. Uh, He's probably not in a great position of power. Yeah, and society basically has already condemned all the priests. Right. So 
at that moment he learns, and this is where the arc happens, right? That he needs to hide the problem just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's his turn. His turn is literally to, yeah. to, to, he falls from the grace that he was supposed to represent. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you know, I, I suspect if I rewatch the film, I probably get a better sense of that arc. Um, but that makes total sense. So that makes me appreciate uh, the film in that way too. So interesting, definitely interesting points. Yeah. Uh, and then there's Sando Khan, who I think it's, uh, it's a very complicated character. Yeah, he is. Um, you know, of all the performances, his might be the one I like the least. Um, he kind of acts as the chaos agent. And more than dislike, I'm just not totally sure how to feel about his performance. Um, yeah. Well, he, he was probably one of the weakest actors, Roberto Farias. He, uh -huh. he's, he tends to be a weaker actor in general in, in films. Okay. Um, although he was pretty good in... Uh, um, uh, that prison escape we watched, uh, the the prison escape movie we watched before. Jailbreak. Oh, 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 oh! He is in that one. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. the one with the big mustache. He's basically oh, okay. the main, the one of the two main characters. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a tricky character and performance to evaluate because you need do need something there. Um, but I don't know. I I, I don't know if I loved love that one i i think they decided I, i'm curious if they decided to sort of because you know like in most cases on um, when we're talking about survivors of you know sexual assault the survivor is someone who's depressed someone who's suicidal or someone relatively normal mm -hmm. that you know, suffer a huge trauma. And of course, that, that's the biggest problem with that person. But that person is basically right. dealing with it. Yeah. But the reality is that a lot of survivors are, because they're survivors of a horrible, horrible thing, they're mentally fucked. Yeah. And, and in that sense, I think some, it, it is hard to... Perhaps it's hard to to see that, but I think it is interesting. I find interesting how this movie literally said, "This is a survivor we're gonna have, someone right. who's mentally fucked, someone who's homeless, who is like on hella drugs, who you know who's crazy, just lost his mind because you know, the church literally and figuratively fucked him." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. You make good points, and I don't. I, yeah, it, it's a very uh, manic performance, and you obviously need that uh, in order to make the film work too. And I don't even think that part's necessarily unrealistic, um, but it is. I don't know. <laughs> it's it's uh, uncomfortable at times, as you said, a little bit funny, um, and uh, definitely quite strange. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think this. So this is the part where, like, perhaps his character was the one that got chuckles out of me as well as some of the interviews um mm -hmm. and that's perhaps why i find like okay there's a little bit of humor here i mean the the, the way this character would describe you know all the fucked up shit that was happening that you know he ex would either witness or experience first in first person of the church mm -hmm. but then repeat it in other moments where he's just like I don't know. I guess I guess the way he would just kind of almost it almost seemed like he was fucking with them, like you know, in a figurative way. Like he was just sort of uh, taunting them, taunting the priests. Right, I right, I enjoyed right. that. Like that was like his way of revenge. And yeah, fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I, go ahead. Yeah, you know, and and I perhaps the 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 ending is probably the part I enjoy the most, right? Where he ends up in the house. He's mm -hmm. homed with his monster, sure, but he's homed. And he straight up is like, uh, you know, he, he's like, he sort of gives orders too. He's just like, hey, you know, these are all the drugs I have to take. And if I don't take them, I, I get chatty. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. And, so uh, the ca- Catholic what? Church can basically fund uh, his drug habit. Yeah. I, I thought it was funny. I also love yeah. that, that how he lists like basically every single drug, both uh-huh. legal and illegal, <laughs> that you could find on a book. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> it, that was uh, quite a list. Um, the other scene that uh, you could argue is unnecessary or necessary is the part where he's with the women and yes. uh, he has that, uh, which is a very uncomfortable scene. Um, but uh, you could argue that it's necessary um, in the way that it just shows that this guy is, uh, this guy, as you said, is, is um, you know, he's gone just a little bit messed up uh, from uh, from the world. And so he do- just doesn't know how to interact with it in a similar way to Padre Vidal. Um but it's a, uh, <laughs> it, it's an uncomfortable scene. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he uh, this, it's kind of interesting because the movie all kind of in that scene it sort of plays a little bit with, uh, with many little themes, but if this is a scene that if if I were to cut out any scene, this I would cut off cut out this scene. Same here. Same here. However, I, I, I think that, you know, because this in, right, he's with that woman. I think they're sort of, sort of starting to date because he meets her like earlier on. Mm-hmm. Uh, she also looks kind of, I don't know, like a dry, drug addict or something. She, she looks really pale and like sort of, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, what, what's interesting, I guess, with, with that scene is... A couple of things, right? One, he talks about how he wants to ruin the priest. So it shows that he knows that he's taunting them a little bit. Mm-hmm. But but two, then, uh, you know, he asked to be pegged by that woman mm-hmm. when they're going to have sex. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, that's perhaps the trauma repeating it because... There are other scenes where, when he's talking to uh, uh, Father Vidal, mm-hmm. where he seems uh, uh, kind of homophobic. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, Which you know might not be. I don't know. Might not be unusual. Uh, oh no, uh, not at all. Yeah, not at all. And and in this scene, when he's asked to be pegged, at first she kind of goes along with it, but then later she's like, "No, fuck this, fuck this. This is weird." And then she kicks him out of the house altogether, which also could be like you know, she might be homophobic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, all of that is just uh, so, so it gives you, I guess, a little piece of society. But nonetheless, I would cut off that cut out that scene if I was cutting out a scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it does make the give you the feeling though that it's like. This guy is just totally messed up as far as, uh, like, not that anything he did was, like, outright wrong, but he just doesn't know how to interact with the outside world. Um, so it does establish that. You're like, this guy is just totally fucked, uh, and he's obsessed with these priests because he's bringing it up in this context, which is usually not something you'd bring up uh, <laughs> on, on a date if you're trying to show your best self. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, it, it does it does serve a purpose. Um, but I do agree with you. If I were to cut any scene, it would definitely be that one. Yeah. Um, with that said, again, uh, Sando Khan does have probably the, the few lines that, I mean, some of the lines that have gotten chuckles out of me. And then I guess the other part was the, uh, so going into the, the I guess, funny scenes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the interview scenes in general, to me, are probably at some moments very f- funny, perhaps because of the rationalizations that the priests were sa- uh, saying uh, were using. Mm-hmm. Do you find any humor in there, or am I just kind of fucked mentally? Uh, you know, I think I think we find humor in the same things. I just I think you are quicker to think of them as funny uh, because we've had conversations in the past on some of these films, and we're, you're like, I'm like, I didn't find that funny. And then you're like, I did. And then you enlist the moments and like, okay, fine. I, I did find those funny. So I, I think I did find moments of humor in there. Um, would I describe them as funny? Probably not. 
<laughs> but but uh, I think that's more a difference in how we uh, process stuff and think of them internally. Like I don't see in my notes funny or humor or anything like that anywhere. Um, I, but I probably did chuckle a little bit at a couple moments, especially I with guess, um, the it, it, father that is always forgetting. Oh yeah, the um, the one who's completely senile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so so to me, I, I have to me, I guess the funniest conversation was between the. Uh, the father Ortega, you know, the, uh -huh. the children's snatcher and uh, Garcia where uh, Ortega is trying to explain, you know, the suicide. And it's like, oh, maybe, maybe, uh, uh, maybe the father, when he arrived, he, uh, he saw this shitty house, walked in and saw this shitty priest and the shitty food in the shitty town and just, uh, <laughs> You know, he said, fuck, my life is shit. And he shot himself. <laughs> I thought like that, that whole line of reasoning, I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's that, uh, there is, uh, you know, I don't know. There, there was that, there was uh, the trying to explain um, how he got the gun. And it's like, uh, maybe it was at a strip club. It's like, so, so <laughs> yeah, you yeah, think, yeah. you know, it should, those little th little moments. Right, right, right. I mean, even the ending, right? When uh, Sando Khan is basically shoved onto that house, onto the priest. Like, there is a little bit of justice. Not, not the justice we would like to see. We'd like to see those priests in, in prison. But there's a little bit of justice in that the priests become the ca uh, caretakers of Sando Khan. Uh-huh, right. And, you know... Uh, and I think there's uh, some humor in that. That as well. I mean, it's certainly ironic, yeah. Um, so I, I do think there is. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's not laugh out loud funny. Uh, no. It's not like laugh track, but there is some uh, wryness to it. Yeah, I, I guess that's. I mean, for you don't want more humor than that for this subject matter. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I mean. It, I guess also going back to Sando Khan, I mean, some of the shit he said, like to me, it was just so, so fucked that I also probably found it funny. Like he kept on talking yeah. about the, the holy seamen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. Again, I, I might be fucked here, <laughs> like mentally. I might be like <laughs> messed up myself. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, for me, at least, uh, it's, it's a little hard for me to tell uh, how much that's supposed to be outright funny or not. Uh, uh, just because tone in like foreign language is, I don't know, just always a little bit different, you know, mm -hmm. trying to get that translated. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, besides that, um, I don't have much more. Yeah. Well, we've gone on for, uh, a while. over an hour. So, so we, we've, uh, We've uh, talked a lot about characters and all that stuff. Yeah. I guess the the last thing uh, maybe to talk about is the imagery. Of course, this is, the, mm. uh, this is a film about religion or the Catholic Church. But I do, th I do think it was sort of interesting how uh, on the most crucial moments, uh, uh, the Catholic Church imagery was very present. When uh, cast, uh, when uh, what's it called? Father Vidal is crying for his dog. You have that giant cross right in front of him. Um, actually, the the moment uh, the the moment where uh, Father Garcia brings um, brings Sandokan to the house, uh, the first thing he does is wash Sandokan's uh, feet. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. Uh, when uh, Mother Monica is cleaning the blood off the dead priest, she's wearing a nun's robe, which is kind of interesting, especially when you figure out that she's not even a nun. Mm -hmm. so, so you got all those little elements, which was kind of interesting. And then, of course, ending with uh, a, a Catholic uh, Spanish song about mm -hmm. cleaning up the sin sins. And in fact, there's a lot of Catholic songs in there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think that stuff's all well done. And to think that 
this whole film is all about like Catholic priests, and I don't think we even see the insides of a church uh, the whole time, but it still <laughs> manages to get those imagery in. And it's not over your, it doesn't beat you over the head with it either. Um, so I, I like that aspect of, to it uh, for sure. Yeah, uh, it's it's good. It's crazy how like uh, like the 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 least bad guy, because I, I don't know what the senile guy did. No one knows. <laughs> it was probably bad. But yeah, no one knows. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was gonna say whatever, whatever the thing he did, it was probably the worst. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's crazy that you know the military chaplain during a dictatorship that murders thousands of people was like probably the least bad. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, uh, what do you rate this movie? Uh, I give it a solid uh, eight out of ten. Me too. Okay. Solid eight. Um, who won? Ooh, there's a lot of candidates here. Um, you could totally give it to Alfredo Castro or uh, Antonio Zegers. Uh, um, but I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and give it to Pablo Lorraine, uh, who uh, definitely um, impressed me with this film, and I can see a lot more of uh, why people gave him the reins to a film like Jackie, um, and I see kind of the promise of him. As a filmmaker so it's good to see uh have someone just sort of disprove uh uh sort of like i don't know it, this is a good movie and i i and i enjoyed it a lot more I, I thought it had a lot more to say and it kept me glued to the screen in a way that jackie did not yeah no i give it to uh la reina as well i think uh he, okay. he he definitely i mean this is where he shows that he's a really good good filmmaker uh mm-hmm, mm-hmm. despite making boring films uh right, once right. in a while yeah i mean i would say this is definitely uh amongst the top chilean films that i've seen um i'd have to think about that list a little bit more but uh it's definitely uh probably the top couple so uh, I, I will throw throw in a, a fun fact about him he is the son of a chilean politician who's very conservative <laughs> I always find that interesting. Like, and all the films that La Reine makes are like very left wing. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I was reading his Wikipedia page before and they were saying like, well, it was a big deal when he endorsed like the center left candidate or something because of like his very conservative uh, heritage. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this time he, he endorsed the, the left left guy too. Yeah. Recently. Honestly, I, I when you picked a Chilean film, I thought this was going to be something to do with the election or something like that, but it had nothing to do with that at all. No, so, no. Uh, uh, I, I really was like, fuck it, I'll pick a movie I've seen that I actually uh-huh. liked. And I was like, oh, this one. And, you know, it's a good movie to end the year. Yeah, it was good a good movie. pick. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's uh, nice to see some talented... Uh, international filmmakers uh, that you know uh, were I'm kind of familiar with, but like not familiar enough to have seen most of his works. Yeah. All right. Well, do you have any last words? Uh, um, I mean, just real quickly, uh, I thought technical aspects of this were well done. Score and cinematography were both good, um, and like a really gorgeous location and stuff like that. So, just wanted to tack that on at the end. Oh shit! Yeah, we didn't even say that. Yeah, That's no, beautiful, <laughs> beautiful location, beautiful lighting, uh, interesting filters at some moments. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it reminded me a lot of uh, A24, uh, just the score and like uh, some of the filters on the film. And, yeah. you know, I like the look of a lot of A24 films. So um, in that sense, uh, 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 yeah, thumbs up for me. Yeah, I know, for sure. Uh, makes you want to visit that town, even though the, the, the bros uh, said that it was a shithole. It it does look overcast as fuck uh, <laughs> when they filmed, um, so maybe go during the summertime. Uh, but you know, maybe that's also just the mood they wanted to capture in this film, which I think is probably the correct mood uh, 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 to have. Yeah, I mean, actually, that town looked like fucking going to um, Ocean Shores, New England, or something. <laughs> oh? oh, Ocean Shores, yeah, Ocean Shores as well. <laughs> something yeah. where there's just like not a lot of sun. Uh, well, that's Southern Chile. <laughs> Anyways. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, in that case, uh, you know, uh, Happy New Year, New Year's. If you're, listen- if you're listening uh, uh, when this comes out, 
Happy New Year. If you're listening yeah, like way happy later, New Happy New Year's anyways, because you know, it's going to be a new year no, no matter what, uh, from the time we're recording this. <laughs> yep. Yep. We will see you next time. See you next time. Adios. Ciao. All right.